Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever and whenever you're watching us. Welcome to another episode of Conical Supremacy. My name is John Noreko, and I'd like to take a second to introduce my co-host and the guy who thought this thing up, Mr. Doug Tornquist. Hey, Doug, what's going on, man? Hi, John. Good to see you. <clears throat> Happy Father's Day. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate that. How was your day today? Uh, just fine. Busy, busy, you know, up with the sun, uh, nonstop work. I even got in some practicing, you know, farmer's market, clean the house, all those Sunday things. It's good. You know, you were, you're, so, you're so funny. You mentioned that uh, yesterday morning, uh, Tammy and Taryn dragged me out to the uh, farmer's market yesterday and that we have out in Corona. And I got to go more often, man. Oh, yeah. The produce was off the hook. I know. It's, it's all about the berries right now. Oh, no. I got radishes the size this big, man. I don't know what they're feeding. It must be some type of leftover nuclear stuff or something, but they were like this big. And I'm a big radish fan. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, hey, uh, you were saying uh, prior to the show that you were working yesterday. Can you talk about that at all? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was, uh, you know, part of it was a record date and we and assembled we're in the a, 1990s again yeah right i mean it was <laughs> no it was it was even better than that it was um you know a full orchestra strings woodwinds uh brass and we were over at uh, fox you know can you say and, who it was for uh i think so. it was for michael buble oh cool and yeah and he was he was recording a song and he wanted to do it in the old-fashioned way so he came right out in the room and sang in front of the orchestra and it was well, um, how cool is that you know it was it was beautiful you know so often they don't uh, they don't even show up to the record session the record right. dates you know it's pre-recorded but um you know but i mean barbara streisand likes to, likes to work that way and um you know and and michael buble did yesterday and uh, it was it was awesome you know because it just it got it was great and then it just got better each who's, time whose chart was it uh Do you remember you mean what was the song no, no. Who who did the arrangement for the song? Uh, it was a name that I should know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't Frank Comstock because Frank is no longer with us. So it no, was, <laughs> no, no, no. But, uh, okay. Any, anyway, anyway. <laughs> um, anything else happening? Oh, you've got a uh, your your little impresario thing. Right, For those right. of you out there who are interested in going up to Hollywood land and checking out some music, you want to talk yeah. about that for a second? Well, sure. It's the second in the, the summer 21. Well, summer starts tonight, but in our concert series uh, here in Hollywood land, you know, we, we started last year because there was no music in the city. So we were doing, uh, it was actually one of our guests ideas. I thought it was a bad idea until I tried it and it would actually turn out to be a great idea. So I want to thank you publicly. Um, we have a, a brass quintet playing a little concert tonight and it's mostly for friends and neighbors, you know, about a hundred people will gather down in the parking lot there. And now that, um, masks are off and we can, um, mingle. It's going to be, it's it gonna be, be a, awesome, dude. It should be I nice. Mean, yeah. Yeah. And the, and the weather's going to be perfect. Um, it'll be a nice balmy 70 something and, uh, 79 yeah. ah, hey the california promise the california promise it lives <laughs> it lives well hey um you know we we had the opportunity this week to, to hang out for a day up at your place and uh i gotta tell you errol's on fire yes he is the kid can play man i am it, it makes me feel great to see a 20 something who's embracing what music really is Wow. It's, just, it's just a great thing, man. He, you know, I'll say this. I've said it to his face. I can say it here. But he he made the most of this past year. Uh, you know, at USC, we were 100% online, which could have been a bad thing. But for him, it was a great thing. You know, he used the technology at his disposable, disposal, connected with people all over the world, took lessons from anyone who would say yes, and learned and so much. And that's the right thing to do when you've got time like that. I sure mean, was and the technology yeah. available to mm -hmm. you it's just oh yeah it's oh, a yeah. Beautiful, beautiful thing hey um i wanted to talk about just for a second here um mm -hmm. our very good friend bob tucci sent me um a bunch of mouthpieces this last week and they're all the sousaphone power mouthpieces yeah and uh lucky enough uh 
I got my friends uh, in the Disneyland band. They took them to rehearsal, and now um, it looks like they're going to be using those on their big Yamahas, the D band, all the time. As soon as I'm back, I'll be using it on mine because, uh, as I've said before, half of my day is on sousaphone and the other half of my day is on C. Yeah. So, uh, but I wanted to kind of uh, give the folks a taste of. Um, I used to do a lot of brass band stuff, and uh, when I was doing these live streams last year, and this has been about about a year, right, Q? It was August. It was August. August. All right. So this recording's from August of last year, and. Uh, I had a bunch of my brass band mates uh, over on the uh, East Coast say, hey, man, we never see you on the concerts play sousaphone or anything. And I'm like, OK. So I got my horn out and uh, we recorded this one. And throughout most of our shows, we've been playing like with my stuff. It's been film music or, or jazz tunes. And this one's actually a pop tune. It's one of my favorite Stevie Wonder tunes. And um, it just it's it's become a staple in brass band type stuff because it's so much fun to blow on. It's not a lot of changes, fun. It's got a nice hook to it. Anyway, I just wanted to give you guys a taste of a, a little, uh, I wish. So here you go.
made up of 28 musicians, 25 brass players and 3 percussion players, and is the only full-time professional brass band in the world. Now we have five different series and various locations around western Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh's perfect for the River City Brass because Pittsburgh is an old steel and coal town, and those were the towns that spawned the original brass bands in the Industrial Revolution in the UK. River City Brass was founded in 1981. We still have some audience members that attended that concert and have attended every single concert since that time. 94% of the audience typically renews their subscription every year and have done so for a large number of years. There's no other arts organization in Pittsburgh with such a high track record. We're very proud of our work in the community, especially the education work that we perform. Our Saturday music program is a partnership between ourselves and Pittsburgh Public Schools. We're able to offer music lessons free of charge That also incorporates our long-standing youth band. One, two, three, four. River City Youth Brass Band was founded 27 years ago and is supported by members of the River City Brass as coaches and teachers. Two years ago, a Facebook friend of mine, Mr. John Impande, had started that band and he had 150 children and 30 instruments. Well, that inspired the campaign Horns for Africa. We asked people to donate old brass instruments to the River City Brass and send them on to the children in Africa. We can see the difference that that makes on their lives. Support River City Brass. When you do, you'll be supporting not only an organization which takes music to the people, such as concerts at the UPMC Seniors Centers, but above all, an organization which teaches at-risk students and is helping children be educated in the third world. Music can really impact a person's life. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, we have the one and only Dr. James Gorlay. Thank you so much for showing up today, man. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Good evening and good morning or good whatever. Uh, well, you. that's that's the thing. It, you know, in our in our technology days now, it's it's whenever people are watching us, man. So it's all great. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks again for taking a Sunday afternoon out and spending it with us, Doug. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, 
You know, James, I, I hadn't met you before today, but I'm, I'm just absolutely in awe of what you've done. I, I was trying to write up a little um, paragraph to introduce you. And it's like, you've, you've had such a dream career. You know, you've, you've performed at the highest level. You've won auditions. You've served as an orchestral tuba player. You've played chamber music with the greatest chamber ensemble of all time. You've got solo recordings out there. You've created programs, administered programs, and now you've got this incredible life as a conductor with the only ensemble of its kind in the world. You know, as, as Tommy Lasorda would say, you've, you've forgotten more than any of us are ever going to know. Uh, <laughs> it's just, we, we are honored to have you here today. Um, thank you so much for joining us on the Conical Supremacy. Um, yeah, hey, Doug, can I interrupt for just one second? Um, always. James, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, <laughs> um, James, can you tell us, you posted this yesterday, but I really think the audience needs to know about a, a serious career move that happened yesterday for you. Do you mind talking about that for a second? Well, um, I've been working at Duquesne University for a couple of years as adjunct professor of tuba and euphonium, and that's been a great pleasure. And uh, just for the fall semester, I'm being promoted to the title of uh, director of bands and uh, conductor in residence. And that means I'll be working with the symphony orchestra and all the bands in the university. I must say, I'm really looking forward to it because I had a taste of it when my predecessor was on sabbatical. And uh, I want to say that the students and I, we got on like a house on fire, as we say in Scotland. And it was, <laughs> it was, uh, it was, it was a meeting of minds and it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, congratulations to you, sir. And uh, seriously, what what an absolute honor. I I think it's wonderful that that they saw a really great conductor in you, and not just a, a player, because you are a fine, fine player. But your your work with River City, all the other things, and you know, Doug and I were talking about this. I mean, what kind of led you? Can, can we start at the beginning? I mean, Doug had a had a, kind of like a, a really good timeline, Doug. I yeah, mean, where I just it, it's like this whole this wave thing, man. And I, and well, I, I, I got to figure out the wave. Well, <laughs> I, I always love to hear people's background. <laughs> you know, what, where, where, how, how did you how did you find the tuba? How did the tuba find you? And you know, what, what was your early education like and where did you go to college? <laughs> oh, well, luckily I have a good memory because these, these, this was all a very long time ago. Uh, 55 years to be precise, I've been playing the two bar. Okay. Uh, uh, the school janitor in the, in the elementary school where I, that I attended came around the classrooms with one of the teachers. He had been a player, he was a player in the local brass band, in the, in the village brass band, <clears throat> Mr. Ross, his name was, and uh, he was asking for people to volunteer to join the band. Of course, there were no volunteers. And uh, the teacher then said, we thought this was happen. Here's a list of the volunteers who are going to stay after school and and become the school brass band. And my my name was on the on the list mainly because I used to play in goal for the soccer team at the school. And in the previous game, I let in 10 goals. So I, I guess that they thought he he should be fired from being in goal. And take <laughs> so we, we um, the 10 of us, there were 10 of us and we lined up in order of height and the small ones got cornets and horns and I was the tallest and I got the two bar. <laughs> and uh, and that was how I started to play, and I, I must say I enjoyed it right from the get go. And uh, we had a lesson after school every every evening. Mr. Ross gave gave us a lesson every single evening after school. Wow! And we were playing as a little group after about a week and a half, uh, hymn tunes and things like that for for school assembly. He was a he was a great teacher, and he's he's still the person to whom. I give thanks for giving me the gift. You know, everybody, everybody has a what was that? A famous, a famous teacher is probably one of my emails coming in, and it pinged. So yeah, and uh, I still, I still used to go. He's he passed away about six months ago at the age of one hundred, literally at the age. Oh of my goodness, really? And uh, and I still used to go back to Scotland and have lessons with him. And this is. Uh, 
this is a, a mark of the man <clears throat> when my mother passed away I went of course you go to the funeral and I, I played uh, Amazing Grace on the tuba as the casket was being you know going through the curtains all this kind of thing very dramatic moment and at the end of the service I came out of the, um, the place and um, you know how you shake hands with everybody everybody says condolences condolences oh so sorry about your loss I come to Mr. Ross and he says you know your middle A's are still sharp how many years how many years do I have to tell you that <laughs> Uh, 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 it figures right man <laughs> it figures the thing is he was quite right <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey you know what I, I you just gave me a, a wonderful idea do, doug do you mind if we take a second and throw this Let's up do, right here yeah. um you know we we started this podcast during covid because we were bored and we really wanted to start talking to everybody out there but you did a really fun version of amazing grace didn't you I, I, yeah, I, I did a, a quartet with myself. I was going to say I, I played with myself, but that has diff, that has a double meaning. We have to. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you mind? Do you mind if we throw that up? Because you you're the one that brought it up, and it just sparked in my head right now. So, so let's listen to a little James Gorelick playing uh, with different versions of himself. There you yeah. go. <laughs> that's just some fun stuff and you know way to go man i mean that, i guess that's what you do when you're bored right what happened oh there we go i had uh, i had absolutely no experience at, at recording myself as people recorded me but i never oh. recorded myself i had no experience of doing video and then um, <clears throat> one of my students said hey you should try this uh a cappella app on the iPhone where you record yourself. Yeah. The only thing is you can't really edit it. So all you have to make sure you've got four times a perfect take. It doesn't have to be the first one. <laughs> that has to be, but you can't go in and edit the sound. And uh, it was a great discipline and I, I learned a lot doing it and listening. I think that was about the first one I ever did. And um, well, I got a lot better at it because I did uh, quite a few of them uh, throughout the COVID years. We were shut down. There's nothing. Couldn't really do anything. Yeah, I, I think all of us, Doug and I, have talked mm -hmm. at length about this over the last uh, thirty shows or so about 
<clears throat> the learning curve and us trying to get better and how we think that this is actually going to be part of yeah. the regular now. It's, it's just the way it's, it's, it's going to be integrated into how we teach, how things are done, all this other kind of thing. And I, I actually am looking forward to it. I learned a bunch. I mean, didn't you, Doug? Well, yeah. I mean, I had to learn Pro Tools and I had to record. I had to turn this room in my house into a home studio. And I told all my students they had to do the same thing. And they're all better at it than I am, which is the way it's supposed to be. you know. But I think to be a 21st century musician, you have to be able to record yourself and collaborate electronically. There's just, yeah. yeah. You know, there, there's a bunch of stuff I wanted to get to today, Doug. Yeah. And do you mind if we kind of, um, I, I wanted to move into the Gregson. Let's do it. Uh, yeah. So, so let's, let's talk about the Gregson for a second, if you don't mind. Well, yeah. You know, James, I, I always associate that piece with you, even though I just learned it was written for John Fletcher, but your recording of that piece is, so beautiful. I listened to it again last night and I, it's just, you know, it's exactly the way I teach my students how to play it. I think yep. in the future, I'm just going to say, listen to James Gourlay's recording. Uh, nice you. Thank you. I, how many times have you recorded that? I think I might've done it three times. Wow. One with an orchestra, there's certainly one with an orchestra and there's one with a yes. brass band, at least one mm -hmm. with a brass band. Yeah. And I think there's maybe even one with a wind band. Right. Uh, James, um, James, do you recall which orchestra? Yeah, the orchestra was the the orchestra of the Royal Ballet in yeah. uh, in London. Mm. It's, on, it's on a Naxos CD with uh, Vaughan Williams and some mm -hmm. other pieces as well. And yeah. uh, that was a fun project, very much so. Was was that your own project? Were you um, were you promoting that, or did someone say, "Hey, let's record these tuba concertos with James"? No, uh, I I, uh, I approached Naxos with the idea. Wow, and, and they said if you can raise the money to pay for the orchestra and the film and the session and all that, and I did. Uh, okay, of and, course uh, you did. <laughs> and, uh, and it was really a lot for me. It was fantastic because uh, the studio in which we recorded that CD uh, was the same studio I played the super it was played in on Superman two and Superman three and also uh -huh. the Batman movie, Phoenix Studio in Wembley, London, and to give them a call and say. Hey, you know that guy that some comes comes in here and plays the tuba for you sometimes? Yeah. Well, I'm going to book you guys <laughs> to to make my CD. They said, yeah. They actually said something with off at the end, but you can't say that. <laughs> get, out of, get out of here. Uh, <laughs> and so I gave them the date, sent them a deposit, and uh, it went from there. But uh, yeah, I, I, I raised the cash and uh, booked the orchestra, <laughs> booked the booked the whole thing. Well, money well spent because it's a beautiful recording. Absolutely. And Thank you. And, and before we, th I want to, I want to play the first movement right now, but when it comes to this piece of music, I have a student that's working on it right now. I think all of us have a student that's working on it right now. What's the one, what's the biggest takeaway for you, James, um, on this particular concerto, as far as character or getting through it and, you know, that thing that you would tell, like even your students, I mean, how do you tell them to get through it? Because I'm just curious. <clears throat> well, I, I think this the the opening, for example, is all about it's all about majestic sound and tone and also very clear articulation. Mm -hmm. And when you cut when you do that page turn and you get into that that lyrical theme is Mark Legato, I think you can put as many slurs in as possible so that it does come out as a line. Uh, you're gonna need a lot of stamina because once you get to the end of the even the first movement it starts to you start to get a little bit tired if you're not in good shape so i always have my students um practice their scales which they do otherwise they don't get a, a proper lesson from me and uh, amen amen brother <laughs> and well i also do them in the class with them and we do uh, two octave scales working in a cycle of fifths so we're going we're going through all the keys and we're going through all the range and I think that helps them cover the range of the Gregson very nicely. So it goes down to what a pedal D or something and goes up to a G. Right. But that that range uh, is something that I think you only get good at by doing. And so something that takes you out of the music. So you train. The idea is that you train yourself to be able to play the piece. You don't repetitiously practice the piece. 
Otherwise, you'll just become dull and boring. Be like your performance will be unbelievably unspontaneous. But if you've got the technique, you've built up the technique and the range and the tone and the sound and the articulations, then you can deploy them almost spontaneously, and then your performance just takes off onto another level. That's my Matt, philosophy. I, I couldn't agree with you more, James. So let let's hear that in action right now. Here's Mr. James Gourlay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Just, yeah. just absolutely wonderful playing. What a great recording! And the orchestra was on fire. I mean, holy crap! It was a, it was a very busy day because I think there are four concertos on that CD, and, and it was recorded in two sessions. <laughs> was, I love, I love you, man. You like to work like I do. <laughs> that's all I could afford. I, I mean, I raised the money to pay the orchestra, and that's all I could afford afford two two sessions so i had to go down very quickly so if, and everybody was was on top form that day it was a really great day that's good music hey doug can you talk about mr gorley's uh commission because oh. I, I i've got another solo coming up that i want to play a little bit of yeah i first of all i just beautiful playing and to record all those concerts i i listened to yvonne williams recording also and it's it's just Spot it's on. superb yeah and i i love the stylistic things you do and I just want to let everyone know you played that on an E flat tuba. That is correct. <clears throat> yeah, I played yeah. the E flat tuba mostly, but uh, ah. actually, that the Gregson. Quite recently, I've been playing it again. I've been playing it on a C tuba. That's how. And, yeah, and it works. It works pretty well on a C tuba. I, I, I love it on C. It's maybe it's, just... it's maybe even better because that big that, sound. Yeah, that fruity bottom register comes yeah. in mm -hmm. a bit better. Um, so yeah, I've been playing it a little bit on the sea, and in, fa in fact, the other day I went back to Manchester to teach and uh, and played it to the students on the sea. Now, of course, Manchester is a hotbed of E flat playing, and, <laughs> and so, even, even they, I think, were mildly converted to the idea that. It was possible to play on the sea. <laughs> awesome. Do, do do you also do you also play the Von Williams on E flat? Is that your horn of choice for that? Yes, piece? it is. Uh, it, wow. Well, it was, but uh, this wow. was a lockdown thing. So because here in the United States, when I'm teaching, uh, the bass tuba commonly is an F tuba. And uh, I didn't even own one. And when we went into lockdown, I thought, OK, this is my lockdown project. I got uh, Dylan's to send me a Chinese knockoff F tuba. And I practiced it every day. And in fact, I, I made a video a video diary of it called the the F tuba boot camp, showing showing how <laughs> how I went over from the E flat to the F and and so now um, I would say well I cannot say I don't play the F anymore, I cannot say that um, I haven't recorded anything um, commercially on it but there's a lot of stuff on the internet of me playing the F. Uh, eventually I got rid of the the, the Chinese knockoff. It was fine but. Uh, I discovered uh, one that I really love, made a handmade one by uh, by Gronitz of Hamburg, Hamburg and uh, it, it almost plays itself. It's one Those are nice axes, man. Those are really yeah. nice axes. I mean, it's windy in Pittsburgh, and I live on Mount Washington, so uh, which is one of the highest points of the city. I think if I if I hang the instrument out of the window on a windy day, it plays itself. <laughs> Uh, that, uh, that is that is a poem waiting to be written amen be brother <laughs> um, so uh, i was amazed to see that you are responsible for over 50 commissions um can you talk a little bit about that i mean when did you start doing that and and what are some of the pieces that have come out of that well I'm, i hope you're not going to ask me what you know list the 50 of the no no that's really good because you know i'm i'm at that age where I'll, I'll go upstairs to look for something and when i get upstairs i think what am i doing here james james we're all at that age here <laughs> well I, I started commissioning pieces really from friends at first you know uh -huh. when I, um, I left i was in the city of birmingham symphony orchestra at very young i was I think i was 18 when i joined that orchestra 
And then I went to the BBC Symphony Orchestra. I was probably, I think I was 21 when I joined that orchestra or just past 21. And I met a lot of composers because it's an orchestra still today that specializes in contemporary music. And uh, I had this thing, I would just go up to composers and say, have you written anything for the tuba? And mostly they said, no. And I was, would you like to write anything for the tuba? And, uh, and sometimes they said, I've already written a piece for the tuba. Uh, for example, the Capriccio by Penderecki, when he came to conduct the BBC Symphony Orchestra, I asked him if he'd written a piece, if he would write a piece for the tuba for me. And he said, no, 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 I've already written one. Uh, <laughs> but, it's, uh, I said, but it's unplayable, he said. I said, well, you know, Maestro, would you let me be the judge of that? And <laughs> did a piece. And he said, um, OK. And I thought he would forget because he was the big Maestro Penderecki. And about a month later, a manuscript arrived uh, from Poland, and it was in his handwriting. I still have it. And, oh, uh, goodness. And uh, I, I started to play that piece around um, quintet shows and uh, other recitals that I had. And one day it was broadcast on the classical station, Radio 3 of the BBC. And uh, it was the first broadcast of the piece, as, as far as anybody can tell. Then I got a call from Schotts, the, the publisher, saying, we heard this piece of Penderecki's that you played. Is that for real? Is that really by Penderecki? Because we don't know anything about that and we are his publisher. And I said, yeah, it's kosher. You know, he sent it to me. And uh, they said, oh, can we have can we have a copy of it? <laughs> so I said, sure, but it's got my markings and stuff like that on, but you're welcome to it. So I sent it to them and then they engraved it. So if you ever play the Penderecki Capriccio, you see all these little commas and black stuff and wiggly lines. Those are my marking. <laughs> so that's so that's you. <laughs> <laughs> Did, awesome. My breath, my breath marks and that's and awesome, breath. James. But but you never recorded that piece. I have recorded it. You yeah. have. I've recorded it. I'm gonna have to look for that. Does it? it you know, because I see. I, I heard Jesuav Piernik play in 1978. Yeah. And is is him. is the piece dedicated to him? It's or certainly, certainly written around him or for yeah. him. Right. And, and Piernik, he, he's, he, I met him in Birmingham in the late 70s, and uh, he's a lovely man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, a great, and, and so interesting what he did with the two bar. You oh, know, yes. That, that, uh, we had tuning slides yeah. that had uh, garden hose pipes running out of them, connected to windmills. And I just, oh, yeah. just blew my mind when I huh. saw that for the first time. Oh yeah, he was—he was quite a show. Um, he just okay. Well, I, I may have some questions for you later about the tempo relationships in that piece, but we'll—we'll we'll make that a private discussion. So, are—are are you still commissioning works for yourself? I am, and I'm also writing pieces now. Oh. Um, I've just had two pieces published, uh, and one is called Steel City Scenes, and the other one is called Mirrors, and they're both—they're both for the big tuba both for, for con, a contrabass tuba, because yes. I found it teaching at Duquesne that there was a bit of a dearth of pieces of pieces that, that students could play on their C tubas. Because if you look at a lot of the competition repertoire, particularly, it presupposes uh, an F tuba or an E flat tuba. Yeah. And a lot of the, the, uh, the solo repertoire is commissioned by and played by or written for folks like me or Badswick or F tuba players, uh, and and so there's a whole there's a whole swathe of of young players that can't play that repertoire or struggle to play that repertoire. So I thought, well, you know, if they're going to play awful pieces, they might have played terrible pieces that I wrote for them. That's right. And uh, and so at the for their final for their uh, for their exams, I write a kind of French conservatory test piece for them. And uh, it's written around uh, one student in particular uh, each time. And I'll choose 
that that student based on not on how great they play but on what their weaknesses ha are right and then and then i'll write all of those things those weak things into the piece that the person has to work on for three or four months and hey lo and behold those weaknesses are suddenly turned into strengths and, that's, uh, that's a beautiful thing james way to go yeah. i just i just finished a piece for uh, uh you know i'm totally in agreement with you I think most of the C-tuba stuff out there is just not, it's not singable. It's not, and I'm a very romantic, when it, a, a diehard romantic when it comes to music. And I think we should be able to sing on the C just as well as we can on the F and everything else. And I just gave Doug the manuscript this week and I wrote it for Doug and I'm hoping he's going to be able to record that soon. Oh yeah. But, um, you know, um, I hate to say this, but we're, I, I, there's more stuff we got to get to. Let's do and, it. And, and I want to throw this up. Right now, by the way, Jim Self says hello, Mr. Gourlay, and uh, he's please, watching please. us right. He's watching us right now. Please call me James. <laughs> uh, I was kind of being funny. <laughs> anyway, James, um, I want to throw up this right now, which I think is probably your heart and soul at this moment in history, and uh, I think everybody's going to figure it out. Go ahead, Q. River City Brass Band, man. I mean, holy crap, does it sound good. And we'd like to welcome our resident brass band guy. Hey, <laughs> hey Sven, how's it going, man? It's going just great. It's a little bit better after that. So, thank you. <laughs> hey, man, thanks thanks for joining us. Uh, Sven's, been on the show, Sven's been on the show before with Two Button Brass, but also he's kind of our go-to guy with all the uh, brass band stuff. And uh, it's just wonderful, James, to have... First of all, you're a wonderful conductor, and I think you really get as much out of the group as you possibly can. And knowing the music as well as you do, because you grew up with this stuff and this sound, I think you've kind of catapulted this group 
into the 21st century and given it a home and a place there that's more accessible to people to listen to. Um, Doug was looking at, I mean, Doug, I mean, he, he's got funding. He's got all this other stuff going on, right, man? Well, I looked at the website and, you know, an organization like that performing at that high level takes a lot of people working very hard. And uh, I just, what a wonderful organization that is. And the fact that you're able to compensate your musicians for their time uh, and give back to the community of Western Pennsylvania. It's, <clears throat> how, how much of this was, did you build all of this or was this in place before you came on board with River City? Oh, a, lot, a lot of it was in place. Uh, it was formed in 1981 by a, a visionary man, Robert Bernat, who went coincidentally to one of the bands that I had worked with, the Grimethorpe Colliery Band. He, he went on a Fulbright scholarship to do a social study by brass bands in the in the north of England and their impact on the community and and so immediately that um, Sheffield, which was actually twinned with Pittsburgh, a steel city itself, was a hotbed, literally a hotbed of uh, brass band activity. He thought that would be easily transplantable back into into Pittsburgh, which was a cold and steel town at the time. Blue collar workers, blue collar audience. They would like that kind of music and he was right i mean he he started with one concert and and started to build on it now uh, the band when i took it over in 2010 was in tremendous financial difficulty they were close to bankruptcy and when they invited me to become the new music director i thought i would be here for a, a couple of months you know my my <laughs> wife and i we thought this would be a blast. We'll go to the United States. It'd be like like being in a movie and we'll come back and we'll pick up where we left off. And so I told all my employers, the Grimethorpe Colliery Band. At that time, I was working also at the uh, Orchestra of the Academy of Santa Cecilia in Rome as a tuba player. And um, I said, look, I'm gone for a couple of months, but I'll be back. They said, good enough. <clears throat> And uh, I'm still here. It's, it's my 11th season now. <laughs> and uh, well, what happened in the in the very first month, really, because we have a, a monthly concert season, is that the ticket ticket sales from which we really depend uh, increased by about 20 percent over what over the previous uh, series concerts, and. At first, we thought this was just curiosity. They wanted to see the 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 new music director or the this, the, this funny Scotsman, and um, well, it kept on increasing. And then we got closer to being uh, solvent, or it was always a struggle living hand to mouth, but we were living. And uh, just before COVID, we were in the best financial position we've ever, we ever have been in. Uh, with surpluses in the bank and making surpluses every year uh, for the last four or five years. You don't say profit because we're a non-profit organization. So we use that, that little euphemism, a surplus. And so the, as a business, uh, it has grown in the last 10, 11 years quite nicely. When, when I took over the, the organization, we were close to four hundred to $500,000 in debt long-term debt that we had no way of paying. And now we have a, a good um, 300, 400 in the bank surplus, uh, which we're going to use to finance the upcoming season when we reopen again uh, uh, after the fall. How many, so, weeks, so, how many weeks season do you have, James? Well, we normally, we normally have um, uh, seven months of the year, we have five concert venues. So we have five concerts, little break, rehearsals for the new for the next series, then five concerts, and then that pattern goes through. Starts usually in September and goes through to December. Then January and February are diff they're difficult months to put concerts on here in Pittsburgh because of the weather. But we re reopen March, April, and May. So, so in a in a normal year, uh, we self present about. Um, for the musicians, is about 66 paid services. Uh, and then on top of that, we have engagements from other presenters that book us. So 
in a good year, we could have as many as 90 to 100 concerts. It's wonderful, man. That's just, yeah. that's just wonderful. That's, that's such a beautiful thing. Um, Sven is building brass bands here in Los Angeles. Yeah. And he built a great one, which uh, you know, we couldn't recreate because of COVID. But he's starting up again. And there's, uh, what advice do you have for someone who's starting a brass band program in this huge city, which has very little brass band presence? Which should have one. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Players are here. That's probably an advantage that, that there's no, no uh, brass band presence. There was nothing here until um, Bernard made it happen. And he recruited players <clears throat> um, that weren't in symphony jobs who were good enough to, to be in symphony jobs. In LA, you've got plenty of fantastic players, yeah. a, great, a very deep pool of good freelance players. Um, what I, I did when I arrived in 2010 is I decided not to try and make it sound like a British brass band. You see, that I, get. I, I can say this because I am one now. Uh, we're an American brass band. I be, and we, we, we want to be different. We want to want to be unique. And if we want to, and what's the point of copying Black Dyke or Foden's or Fairies or any of those? There's no point to that because one, it'll always be a copy and a copy is always substandard. And B, we Americans, I'm going to say it out loud because I am one, we Americans, we don't have that tradition. It's not in the blood. Well, no, I, I, James, I think you bring up a really important thing. And this is one thing that Doug and I have talked about at length on our show is that um, our students, I always tell my students, and I know Doug does the same thing. Why do you want to sound like me? You want to sound like you. And, exactly. this, and, and this brings up that whole thing about why should a band or an organization sound like somebody else. They should have their own personality. They should have their own sound. And that's what makes it not only unique, but also drives people to come and check it out, right? I mean, you wouldn't have the audience that you have right now if you sounded like Black Dyke. You sound like the River City Brass Band. And and as Sven, we, we listened to a couple of Sven's rehearsals before, and it's not, it doesn't sound like any of the, the British guys, it doesn't sound like any of the Norwegian guys, too, right, Sven? It just no, it doesn't. Yeah, it sounds like this this West Coast thing, and, and yeah, I, and I don't think that should be diminished by anything. As a jazz musician, you know, we used to be looked down upon. Well, you play West Coast jazz as opposed to New York jazz. No, and I'm, I'm not kidding. In, in those circles, there's there's this weird thing like West Coast jazz is substandard. I mean, you don't make it until you go to New York. I think that's BS. I think it's just this this culmination of people here creating this sound just like you have this culmination of people here making this sound and yeah. and and they're both good right yeah and, and and in fact i would much rather hear that because every time you know i didn't check out your band until just this last week or so but i've, I've listened to a number of different cuts and you guys sound like you guys it's a beautiful thing it really is you know and, and, and and kudos, man. I mean, um, we we had another. Uh, who's the Kansas City guy, Doug? That I'm forgetting. Joe, Joe Parisi. Doctor, Joe Parisi. yeah, yeah, Parisi. Joe, Joe. So Joe Parisi, and he sounds. He doesn't sound like the British guys. He sounds like them. It's just them, and and that's a. I think everybody out there needs to like think about that for a second. There's nothing wrong with being different, and there's nothing wrong with sounding how you want to sound as long as it's beautiful. Yeah, quite right. Yeah. The, 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 Sven, the, the, other, the other advice I would give you is, is the repertoire. You know, the, my predecessor as music director of the River City Brass Band, I think he, he was an excellent musician and he was far more highbrow in his, in his choice of music than I am. Now, now this, is, this is extraordinary because um, you know, if you if you see the pieces that I write, they're not lowbrow at all. They are very they're musically uh, challenging. The language is much more is much more challenging. Never play a test piece in the concert. You'll switch the audience off. Just don't right. even, don't even think of it. Right. Um, and you see, the thing is, my audience that come back every year, um, they're they're largely seniors. That's a huge market. 
I mean, right. People think people think, oh, the audience, oh, what we're going to do to get the young people in? Well, don't bother, <laughs> don't bother, don't bother. Get the old people in. There are lots of them. There's yeah. the ones with the money. And they've got, <laughs> yeah, they've got disposable income and they love it. And you know, don't aim for brass players. I don't think there's a single brass player comes to my concert. And 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 I don't I don't care. Whoever wants to come, they come for a nice night out. And uh, and they get it. And they get they 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 write to me, they write to me personally on letters and postcards, believe it or not. Awesome. And sometimes, and sometimes an email. You know, I'll get things like, James, you need a haircut. Well <laughs> <laughs> once a lady came backstage from the audience because she said there's a there's a there's a fleck there's a thread hanging on your jacket that's just been <laughs> very, annoying the hell out of me <laughs> and, and uh, you see the thing so we sell them the tickets so we know the details you know when they have a birthday for example so it's just a simple thing you know if i've got a subscriber a long-term subscriber with a big birthday, say a round number with a zero, I'll go around to their house and I'll play happy birthday outside the house. They're probably, going to, be, they're probably going to be in because, you know, if they're 80 or 90, they're not going many places. And, uh, and then there was, you know, there was a wonderful thing. We, we did a, a Glenn Miller show and, do you know, this, this guy comes up to me in the intermission or what I used to call the interval. And we had played Pennsylvania six five thousand, and he's and he's an old guy. He's in his nineties, and he's he's still you know very sprightly, and he says to me, "That was fabulous." You know, I had the first performance of that at the Pennsylvania Hotel, at what, on and it was my honeymoon. His wife was there also, you know. And I, what an amazing thing! See, we take them with that kind of music. We take them down memory lane. And in that moment, they, they hear that piece played nicely. They are transported. There's a time machine for them. And they're holding hands in the audience and they're remembering their honeymoon at the Pennsylvania Hotel in New York City. That gets them back into the hall. You no. know what? That, yeah. it, the beautiful things, man. And, and speaking of that, I want to push this up right now because what a great segue. Talk about programming. This one is one of my faves. And... Uh, you know, let's let's just watch it. <laughs> watch it.
no, that's way too fast. Now you have to do it in tuba style. See, that's programming. I'm, I'm sorry, that's just fun stuff, man, right? It's not yeah. only fun for the band, but it's fun for the audience too, right? That's a clap along piece as well. Yeah, man. Yeah, so you get the audience clapping along. <clears throat> and then, yeah, it's, it's funny, yeah. We have a lot of fun with the, that, uh, that particular set, which we call Celtic Connections. And we have it every year in March. And we have bagpipes and we have dancers and we, we link the Irish and Scottish traditions to bluegrass and country country music, that kind of thing. It's quite fun. Well, that's because the Irish and the Scottish are the best music. Anyway. Uh <laughs> and and there's, a stack, there's a stack of them around here in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Sven, you got something for Mr. Gourlay? I mean, it's just fantastic. It sounds great, and and the one of my one of my questions was was going to be when you arrived, were you ever going to try and move to alto horns? But you were saying you were going to just let them be. No, that's the thing, you know. Getting getting. What do you what do you think about that? I I never thought to change the French horns to the to the alto horns. Um, we I get that question quite a lot actually. Yeah, I can People, imagine. Yeah. People send me, particularly from alto horn players, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it would be hard to find good alto horn players around here. You have to get Shona White to come home and play on something like that. <laughs> well, you could get them as a soloist. I've had, I've right. had, a, I've had, um, I've had Paul Bennett over as a, as a soloist, and that was really nice because it was a very different sound to us. Right, and. Uh, as a solo instrument, it was very beautiful to have that, and the people liked it. But you know, uh, no one had ever ever seen one before. Right. My my not my musicians either. They'd never <laughs> seen one. Right. And, and the audience had never seen one, so they could have come and played the Highland bagpipe. It would have been the same thing. Yeah. Really. But but the way we play, I think the French horn is really great. You know, because we, you know, the. The sound is much more towards the trumpet than the the European cornet sound. If right, you right. The trombone players all play in symphony orchestras, and so do the tuba players. So the sound is much straighter. Right. Now, we do a lot of um, film music transcribed for us, and uh, then the French horns are just killer, you know. Right. Whereas, whereas the alto horn would be... With all respect to to the great players that play it, would be somewhat weaker. 
Right. I mean, yeah, I noticed there was a lot more um, projection. I guess you could say it, br- brightness, brightness in the sound, buzzy, buzziness. Like when I, I listened to your Gale Force uh, recording, and it, it's 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 good stuff. I really I really like it. It gave me a lot of ideas on how to. Because I definitely went into building Brassman in 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 LA as as I'm gonna come and recreate Corey or Black Dyke or you know all those. That's that's just not gonna happen, you know. And we're doing a, a recording project right now, and and I'm noticing how straight, how sustained everybody's playing. Yeah. There's not the wobble on it. No. And I have to really stop myself in like trying to get people to do that. But that's that's it's going to be a completely different project. I'm going to let it. Yeah, as you said, don't don't recreate it. So I'm just going to let it live. But, but Sven, Sven, what's wrong with that? Nothing. What, nothing's wrong with yeah. it. I mean, we all we all we all have these preconceived notions, and sometimes, right. sometimes that magic just happens. And, and it's fantastic. And it's, it's, it's and, yeah. And you have and you just have to recognize that that it is magic. Yeah, yeah. We we are we are doing we're recording. Uh, Lee Baker. Are you? Do you know him? Yeah, yeah. His his arrangement of of Eventide, and it's. I mean, it's 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 incredible it's incredible with how how it's yeah it's it's going to be it's completely different than what i'm used to and it's it's I, i'm really excited to hear that yeah, i don't think like... the thing is if you can when you're conducting a group like that uh, my approach is to is to hold their feet to the fire on 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 various things for example is it together is it in tune is it balanced you get those three things right then a lot of things are just going to sound fantastic Right, and if you try and change a player's, uh, let's say, in the blood way of playing, you right. waste a lot of time. And you know, I'm paying my guys, so I haven't got right. a minute. You know, a rehearsal is going to cost ten thousand dollars. I'm not going to waste. You know, I could, I can count that to the minute. Right. What each minute is costing me, so I'm not going to say, "Oh, excuse me, would you would you put a, a vibrato on that like <laughs> like this guy in England?" No, that'd be a waste yeah, of money. No. And I'm not Scottish. Yeah. I'm not Scottish American for nothing. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. Who am I to tell my the musicians how to how to you know use their musicianship? That's that's not yeah. And also, yeah, they'll resent. They'll resent it. I mean. Yep. Like, they they do resent it. I mean, the very first rehearsal I did with River City, uh, and I didn't even know I was in for the job. Oh, this is a great story. I'm going to tell the story. <laughs> I got an email from somebody saying, would I know anybody that would like to become the new music director of the River City Brass Band? This would be about 12 years ago now. And I truthfully wrote back to the gentleman, uh, no, I don't know anybody, but... Um, I'm a freelance conductor, and if you've got any concerts that you need a conductor for, I'd be happy to come over and do them. And he wrote straight back and he said, what about these dates? And uh, they fitted perfectly. I mean, it's, it's must, it must be serendipitous because <laughs> they fitted perfectly a three-week period um, when I wasn't working with Grimethorpe or with anybody else. So I went over and did a rehearsal. And it wasn't very good at all. It was awful. It was really bad. And at the end of the rehearsal, uh, somebody said, uh, Maestro, it's time for the interview. And I said, what interview? And they said, you've been shortlisted for the music director's job. I said, but I didn't even apply for it. <laughs> <laughs> See what happens when you say yes? <laughs> <laughs> so... I said, okay, I don't mind. I was, I'm happy to speak to anybody. I can speak for Scotland. If it was an Olympic event, I'd have to go medal. So they, they sat in, it was like Shark Tank, or in like that program on the TV. They sat yeah. in the hand places, and there was, a, there was a seat in the middle for me to sit, and I sat down, and uh, somebody said, why do you want this job? By the way, that was me trying an American accent. I know it comes out. <laughs> It comes out like Dick Van Dyke, but never mind. <laughs> why do you want? Why do you want this? Why do you want this job? And I said, look, after a rehearsal like that, I don't know anybody in their right mind who would want that job. <laughs> <laughs> and you can imagine the air was was promptly sucked out of the room. <laughs> and and everybody, they were looking at each other, and I said, any other question? And somebody said, well, if you were interested and you did get the job, 
would you move? <laughs> it's a big F, F, F. I said, would you move to Pittsburgh? And I had to, th I thought that was an e the, the best question. And I said, well, whoever, whoever you choose is going to be the face of the organization. It's going to help get contacts, it's going to help in the community, it's going to reach out into the community. And so that person, whoever it is, has to live in Pittsburgh. So, but hey, it's not going to be me. <laughs> and then I said, so what, what, what's, where's the nearest pub? Let's go down and have a drink. And we had a drink. And then we worked for three weeks together. And although the band improved a tiny bit, Pittsburgh grew on me a lot because it's a great town. It's a lot, it's a fantastic place. So I phoned my wife up, uh, uh, Leah, and uh, which is spelled L-E-A. And so it's funny you should say Lee Baker, but when I ask Siri, hey Siri, call Leah, she directs me to Lee Baker. It's going to happen right now. <laughs> <laughs> right now. <laughs> so um, she came over on a you know, practically the next flight, and we looked around and said, what, what do you think? It's a nice place. And she said, yeah, it is. Now, just to put it into context, in those days, I had about 250 nights in a hotel somewhere because I was commuting between the, the north of England and Rome. So right. Rome, north of England, Rome, north of England. But we lived in Glasgow, Scotland. So most of the time, you know, I wasn't at home at all. I said, look, if these guys offer me, you know, we should think about it because you, you never know, it might be a way to do as much work as I'm normally doing, but, you know, sleep in my own bed. And we and like be the home. Place. Yeah, we like the place. And um, so when they eventually did phone up and said, would you like the job? I said, can I see the financials? <laughs> oh. And then I saw them. I said, to, "Then I said, okay, we'll go, but we'll put everything in. We won't, we won't sell any houses. We won't ditch any gigs because we'll be back in a month. But we're still here, and we're loving it, and it's growing from strength to strength. Of course, COVID put uh, a monkey wrench in the works, but uh, up to COVID, we're doing really great. Well, you know what, James? We're all going to come back stronger. And and I hate to say this, but we've kind of run out of time. No, I mean, we, really? we get, yeah, I know." We could go on for another hour, easy. But um, I, I, I just want to thank you, man, so much for not only your story, but your musicianship, and and your love of music. It, it it makes me feel good that there's other people out there like me who really, really are trying to make a difference in this world, especially through music. And uh, thank you, Mr. James Gourlay. I really appreciate it. And I can't, you know, thank you enough for your time today. Doug, you got anything, man? Thank you so much for hanging out with us and um, letting us get to know you a little bit. And uh, your program in Pittsburgh just sounds amazing. Um, yeah. Come and check congratulations. us out. Congratulations. Come and check us out anytime. Sven, Sven as our resident, uh, you got anything else from Mr. Gourlay? No, I mean, I could talk, I could talk with him for, for, for days. Well, about, we, can do the, yeah. we can do that on the backside of stuff. Yeah, but, let's do that. But, uh, I want to thank everybody out there for tuning in today. Uh, once again, thank you to Dr. James Gourlay for his time today. Um, anybody that hasn't checked out the River City Brass Band, please go check that out. Um, next week, Conical Supremacy will be back on Saturday uh, <laughs> with uh, the one and only Mr. Zach Collins. And uh, I'm looking forward to that as, as I'm Doug. Once again, um, Show 35, I think, man. So, you know, things are going strong. Things are going great. Um, everybody have a wonderful Father's Day, a great summer solstice. And, uh, you know, because I got to go do my Druid thing in a little bit here. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. And uh, yeah, peace out to everybody. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye. Here's a little more of a River City Brass Band. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.